Okay, well, we're at 11.33, so I'm going to go ahead and start with my Kavanah. And um, today I'm going to talk about um, one of the traditions in the Kohenet Hebrew priestess tradition, that the month of Elul is linked with the Tsova, which is the shrine keeper. And each of the months in Kohenet tradition links one of the months to one of the priestess paths, they call them in Kohenet. Um, and the shrine keeper priestess is a guardian of the temple uh, to which the people come for on pilgrimage. This is, a, this is a quote from Rav Kohenet Jill Hammer from the Hebrew Priestess, her book called The Hebrew Priestess. Uh, so the shrine keeper priestess is a guardian of the temple to which people come on pilgrimage. She tends the divine presence through attention to ritual. By preparing space and guarding the threshold, she creates the separateness and holiness that make the shrine sacred. And then she quotes Exodus 38, 8, which says, he made the lava out of copper and its base out of copper from the mirrors of the host, the tzovot of women who served at tzavu, at the entrance to the tabernacle. So the word tzovot appears only twice in Torah, in Numbers 4, 23 and 30, et cetera. The same root, the tzadi beit aleph, refers to priestly service. It also is related to the host of angels, the tzavaot, who serve the Holy One. So vote can mean a host of women or women who serve as one of many or ministering women. The Torah doesn't explain the term or provide any context. So what I know about the copper mirrors, there's a bunch of midrash about them. The copper mirrors were used, it is said, to for the, by the women to entice the men to um, make love to them, uh, to either make themselves beautiful or in some way lure the men because after the exit lost, why bother procreating at all? And the women were like, no, we have to continue procreating. And so they used their copper mirrors somehow to entice the men to do this. And then those copper mirrors were used to build the lava at the entrance to the temple. So it's this, it's, this, it's this bowl of water that was used for purification as the Kohanim went in to the temple. So these, these um, copper mirrors were pounded out and uh, created this basin and the women gave them voluntarily as part of their you know, gifts to the temple as people were called to bring forth their materials. And then from the Babylonian Talmud, Menachot 97a, when the temple was standing, the altar atoned for sin. And now that the temple no longer stands, a person's table atones for sin. And another quote from the Talmud, Berachot 10b, those who host Torah scholars in their homes, the Torah considers them as if they offered tamid offerings in the temple. So this is the rabbis trying to, uh, transform the sacrifices into rituals that happen in the home um, and also get get fed it sounds like because <laughs> the levites got all kinds of sacrifices and offerings and now the now these rabbis who are coming up are like how do we get a little of that food um so you should host torah, torah scholars in your home as part of your altar and so we don't have a temple altar anymore but the shrine keeper the tzavaot the host of women who Ten shrines are now considered to be basically homemakers, according to the Talmud. And, and so the questions that come up here, now there's other types of altars and, and shrines to keep. And I think that that is transforming again. Mostly it's been men in the last several thousand years taking care of the temple and the, the synagogue and the stuff. But there's a lot of women who are doing that maybe behind the scenes or maybe now more, more frequently in front of the scenes, priestesses who are coming up and rabbis certainly, and other kinds of leaders um, who are considered to be shrine keepers. And so my question is for you all here today, what kind of altars do you have in your home? And just consider this, you know, what kind of altars, you know, we don't think about, a lot of people think about altars as being pagan or, you know, but altars are very, very Jewish. Um, do you have an ancestor shrine? 
like my mantelpiece is just full of photos of parents and grandparents and children and grandchildren. Um, and that's a kind of ancestor shrine. It's a, it's a way we can remember our ancestors and call them in. Do you ha set your table for Shabbat with clean linen and flowers and the good dishes and silver? That itself is an altar. Do you have a Havdalah set that you like? That itself is an altar. Or do you have some, any kind, other kind of altar that you tend? Is your workspace or your desk, your art table, your sewing room, is that an altar to you? Because we serve in different ways. You know, you might consider altars being a spiritual, religious thing, but anything that we lay out in that way can be an altar. And some people serve, overserve their work or they overserve their families. But think about the altars in your home and in your life. Do you have a shelf of plants that you speak to? <clears throat> Do you have an outdoor space? Or wind chimes that catch the breath of Shekhinah? Or a flower bed or a vegetable plot that brings you joy of the senses, either with taste or vision? The kitchen is a wonderful place to recognize and create altars where we mix potions known as recipes. We bake cakes of grain and offer pleasing odors unto Hashem and the occasional burnt offering. Um, maybe our barbecue is an altar. God loves a barbecue. Um, what altars do you tend intentionally as altars? And what altars do you tend unintentionally that could be seen as altars? And just consider that right now, this last week of Elul, what kind of altars have you set up either for the divine or for your connection with nature, which is another manifestation of the divine? And here are some activities to think about um, for this last week of Elul. Think about those who serve as guardians to the doorways in your life whether that's a literal doorman or people who help you through major transitions and and find ways to show those people thanks even if it's just silently in your own meditations but consider all the people who have helped you walk through doorways you can also do things like you know smoke smudge your doorways or wash the doorways of your house uh, with bundled sage or other herbs um, to clean your comings and goings. And call on the en energy of the tsova, the face of Shekhinah, to guard your doorways. It's also a traditional time to check your mezuzot. If you don't have mezuzahs, uh, you know, you can make some. Um, but you want to ensure that the scroll is good and in good condition and that it's accurate. If you don't have a mezuzah, you can put one up or you can make one. I've been making them out of cinnamon sticks. And I, I know they're not kosher, but they're kosher to me. Um, I take a couple of cinnamon sticks and I, I use a red thread. Oh, that one just came on. It's checking us speaking to us through the fountain. Um, <laughs> tie, tie a red thread and sew on some anise, some star anise and some beads. And uh, they look like little tiny scrolls all curled up and you can just paint a little or Sharpie a Shaddai on the side and just nail it to the doorpost. I have so many doorways in my house that we have a lot of kosher mezuzah, but I don't have enough mezuzah for all the doorways. So I started making the cinnamon mezuzot and I love them because like they're right at nose height. So as I go through the doorway, I just stick my face, take a deep breath. And, and it's like having the, um, that memory like we do for Havdalah that that the divine is with us as we transition through these liminal spaces because doorways and all these you know the doorway of rosh hashanah but all the doorways in our homes are liminal spaces that that we need protection as we walk through i mean have you ever walked into a room and gone why am i here like all the time for me and more so as i age but like then you walk back out the other room and you're like oh yeah i remember and then go back through because doorways do that they they like they do this um this cutting that happens as you walk through them that you lose whatever it is you came in there for. I have to repeat what I'm like, get the scissors, get the scissors, get the scissors as I walk into the kitchen because I'm like, why am I here? But the same thing is true for like 
we have this really, this is the part of the problem with addiction with screens is that every window is a doorway. Like, so as we flip from one screen to the next, every time if, if I open my computer, I immediately go blank. Why am I here? What was I looking up? And then I go into, oh, Facebook or, oh, look, social media or, oh, emails, you know. So we need protection as we walk through those doorways. So think mm -hmm. about the ways that we can call on the divine to guard us as we walk through physical doorways, electronic doorways, and like spiritual doorways as we're going in to Rosh Hashanah. We're five days out. That's crazy. Five days. I'm going to put a mezuzah on my computer. Do it. Put a mezuzah on your computer. I highly recommend. You can just do a sticky one. A little Shaddai post-it note right there. Oh, little Shaddai stickers. I Wouldn't that be this. great? Yeah. We should make, we'll make a little them. sticker we'll mezuzah. I don't, don't feel like the, um, the um, one of those guys who dump you on the street and make you put on to fill in. What are those guys? <laughs> the Kabadniks. The Kabadniks. Do they I have think they have, stickers? Really? They have, they have, sh they have, um, they have to fill in stickers, I know. Really? But maybe we should make Mesozoic um, stickers so we can put them on our computers. Anyway, that's my Kabadniks for today. That's over. Think about how you can be a shrine keeper for your shrines in your life, literal or figurative, and think about ways that you can put protections on all the doorways in your life now. And now we're going to sound some shofar and we're five days. So we're just going to call as calls as we can. And Diane's not here. So we're just going to call them ourselves. We'll call the way through. <clears throat> you start. I don't remember. Anymore. Shakia. Shvarim Trua. Tikiya Shvarim Tikiya Tikiya Trua Tikiya Shvarim Trua Tikiya Tikiya Shvarim Tikiya Tikiya Trua Tikiya Tikiya Shvarim Trua Tikiya Shvarim Tikiya Tikiya Trua Hmm. Okay, we didn't do the full hundred because we're saving that for Rosh Hashanah, but we will be here tomorrow at 11.30 and Wednesday, yeah, that's Wednesday, and then Thursday, and then Friday is our last uh, shofar online service because we're doing the real shofar on Rosh Hashanah. We will be leading an online, oh yeah, actually a hybrid shofar service on the second day. Correct. Um, yeah, our second day Rosh Hashanah, we'll be doing the shofar service, and then to let you all know, just a little peek ahead, um, we're going to be facilitating uh, an online meeting every night during the days of awe. 
uh, from 7.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. called Text, Talk, and Teshuva. And it's just basically coming together, reading a little bit, maybe sitting for a couple of minutes, and then maybe breakout groups or talking about how we're, how we're doing our Teshuva this year. So anyone's welcome. It's going to, again, be an hour long every night, starting on the first night uh, of Rosh Hashanah, with a Monday night, and going through, we're not going to do it on Shabbat, but we'll do it, um, yeah, all the way up to uh, Yom Kippur, and then on the day of Yom Kippur from 2 to 3 in the afternoon. So that'll be coming out in announcements um, from Havara, but keep an eye out for it if you're interested. Love to see you there.